about six years ago on a Sunday morning, I walked out on the stage to address many of you who were in the audience that day about a topic that I believe that God had placed on my heart and the heart of our leadership team. Several months prior to that Sunday, we sat in a back room in the very first building we built on this property. We began to pray and ask God what the future of our church looked like through a series of leadership development activities and various things that our staff was praying about. We began to write down phrases that stuck out to us. And in those phrases, uh, we couldn't come up with anything that really represented what our community was facing or what our community was going through. And then one of our staff actually took a break, stepped out of the room, and somebody said, why don't you look on her paper? And they grabbed her paper and then uh, the staff that looked down just got quiet for a moment. In that moment, you could tell that something was resonating in their heart. We said, what is it that's, what is it that's got you? What is it that's connecting? And staff member just read out these three words, crisis of brokenness. In those moments, something fell over that room that was as heavy as anything I've ever felt in my life. At that moment, the Holy Spirit began to speak to us about the crisis of brokenness that our community was facing. The, the fatherless homes, the broken marriages, the abusive relationships, the addictive behaviors. Around that time, there were several tragedies in our community as well. So from that, over the next several weeks and months, we began to develop something called For the Love. For the Love of the Lonely, the Overwhelmed, the Vulnerable, and the Empty, the L-O-V-E, Lonely overwhelmed, vulnerable, and empty. One of those letters in that word love really began to resonate as we realized some of the most vulnerable people in our community were children. Not just children, but children without fathers, children without mothers, children without homes. So I stepped out on that stage that Sunday and I began to deliver a message out of conviction. But if I'm honest with you, it was also, um, a time of doubt in my life that anybody would actually respond. And so for the next 35 minutes, I preached on orphans, preached on the father to the fatherless. Since that time, we've seen so many incredible things in our church as it relates to orphan care and foster care. We work with group homes in our community. We oversee a group home in our community. We have many foster care families in our church that have taken children into their homes. But I want to remind you as a church a couple of things that we say our mission at Relevant Church is that we are a community of people helping people live out their purpose in Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says it this way. It's the theme verse behind that statement. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. We say we are people helping people live out their purpose in Jesus Christ. If there's one area that I believe is closer to the heart of God than almost any other area, it's the idea of caring for orphans, caring for children from hard places, caring for children without fathers or without mothers. I don't know if you know this or not, but our system, the DFAC system in our state, and in our country is overran with children looking for homes. Children are tucked away in hotels or in office spaces, some 10, 20, 30 children in one area with no home to live in. As a believer and as a follower of Jesus and one who believes in Jesus' words where he says, bring the children unto me, I can't help but to believe this grieves the heart of God and should be the very center of our focus as a church. I love what Psalm 68 says in verse five and six. It says, a fatherless, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. A relevant church, because we believe in the sanctity of life, we care about all life. We care about the unborn baby. We care about the baby after they're born. We care about the pregnant teenage girl who's scared to death. And we care about the broken hearted adult who has lost parental rights. Because we care about all life, we care about these things. I love a Psalm chapter 10, verse 14 says, but you, God, you see the trouble of the afflicted. You consider their grief and you take it in hand. The victims commit themselves to you and you are a helper to the fatherless. I've told you this many times in our church's history over the last six years. We will embrace orphans because the church is 
God's plan A for our community. James, the brother of Jesus, says it this way. In verse chapter 1, verse 27, religion that our God accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look, at orphan, look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. See, people don't just need a family. People need God's family. We can't do everything, but we can do something. At Relevant Church, we say we want to raise a generation of children that never know a day without knowing Jesus. But I think we got to carry that a little further because there's children in our community and in our state who will never have the opportunity to hear the gospel if we don't step up. And so I've challenged you by telling you we will embrace orphans because we too were once spiritual orphans. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says it this way, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the Old Testament law to redeem those who were under the law because we couldn't fulfill the law ourselves. We couldn't live up to all the expectations. We were cut off from God. We were fatherless. And it says, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So Jesus gave his life so that we might be adopted into God's family and we might leave our sin behind and be welcomed into the kingdom of God. And because you are sons, verse 6, God has sent the Spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy, God. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir with Jesus through God. I believe that as a church and as believers, there may be nothing more like the heart of God, nothing closer to the heart of God than caring for orphans, and the Bible talks about even caring for widows. So recently, I had the opportunity to sit down and interview several families in our church who are currently involved in foster care. I was overwhelmed at the stories from the time they decided to, to take the step on this journey, from the time they got the first call, all the way to they had the opportunity to go meet the child or children that they brought into their home. And then just hearing the memories and hearing the great things that God has done and the rewards that they've experienced in the process. So many tears were shed during the filming of this video you're about to see. And I think if you'll open up your heart and hear what's happening in the lives of children, in the, mom, in the lives of dads, in the lives of moms, and even in the lives of the brothers and sisters in the homes, the children, the biological children in the homes, I think you're going to be inspired. While this video is being shown, I want you to do two things. I want you to ask yourself, what does this require of me? What does this require of me? That's the first thing I want you to ask. The second thing I want you to ask is, what's standing in the way of me doing what God's calling me to do? So I want you to hear these four stories, and then I'll come back and share a couple of other thoughts before we close our time today. I think I have always um, wanted and dreamed about being able to help children in multiple ways, um, but I don't know that that's always been something that you've had on your heart. No, it definitely wasn't something that was on my heart. Um, one Sunday morning, uh, Pastor Carl had a, a sermon talking about uh, caring for or orphans in the brokenness series, and uh, Carrie leaned over to me and, and said, this one's gonna be rough for me to get through. I didn't think anything about it, and two minutes later, I'm bawling my eyes out because God just got a hold of my heart, and it was a very, very clear calling. Um, the Probably the clearest thing that God's ever called me to and uh, I can remember weeks after still struggling to have those conversations uh, and even talk about it. It was such a clear calling and a clear uh, vision that God put in my heart. I strongly felt um, the push. Um, just once my eyes were open to the need that was out there, I, I couldn't help but just think that I can I can help with that. Um, and I felt like we were in a unique situation because we had struggled for so long and it just it just clicked to me like that's what we're supposed to do. Like our our home is empty. We want kids. You know, even if we're not adopting them, like these kids need a place. And you know, one of those. Brett, and you were called pretty early on for a sibling group. That was, you felt that in your heart. Got a sibling group 
while it took me a little bit longer to recognize that that's something that um, we could do. Yeah, I felt like we had, we were kind of uniquely equipped for that mm-hmm. because, you know, a lot of people, they already have a few kids and so they can, you know, they got an extra bed, they got, they can take one, um, but you know, we didn't have, we didn't have any kids. So we took three. Yeah. <laughs> So Jonathan and I had actually talked about maybe becoming foster parents for years. But then when we moved to Georgia six years ago, on our very first visit to Relevant, Carl was talking about the new foster care ministry the church was starting. And he and I just shared this moment. We both looked at each other, locked eyes, smiled, and we knew very clearly that was God saying, okay, this is the time to act on that call. And that's when we signed up for the training with Faith Bridge. We started having a conversation with our children about it, and we became a foster family. Well, as far as for me, the first time I felt God took my heart was really, you know, small group with Jerry, with Carrie and Josh. We were in the small group, and I really just saw their their growth with the, the foster care system, whether it was with Dax or with Charlotte. And I really just, you know, really just enjoyed seeing, you know, the personal and spiritual growth that they had there. And then I heard a message that Pastor Carl had preached with the, the Backyard Orphans very recently and also some previous messages as well that really resonated with me. Yeah, when Backyard Orphans came and we heard that message, when Pastor Carl asked for anyone to stand up, they're willing to partner with foster care families. And Alex was the first person to stand up. That's when I knew that it was our family's time to join the foster care journey. Um, So it was exciting to watch. And definitely being in the trenches with Carrie and Josh throughout their first two placements inspired us and showed us that we're able to do this even with our biological kids and busy lifestyles that we lead. So we were actually at home. We were caring for one of our other kids who were sick and we got a call for Charlotte. Um, Was a six day old baby who needed a home. And I instantly knew she was supposed to come to our house. So I called Josh, we prayed about it. And he, very logical self said, hang on, she's six days old. We don't, we both work. We don't have childcare for her. Um, So then we called a church friend, she prayed with us, and we knew, we put it in Greet Me, and within 15 minutes we had five weeks worth of childcare covered. Um, And that was it, we went to pick up our girl. Yeah, I was at work and remember seeing the text messages come through as weeks and weeks of daycare, and or not daycare, but weeks and weeks of uh, coverage for babysitting and stuff were getting covered and just, uh, all the emotions of this this was the right time and everything was, you know, you could see God's hand over it. So for our first call, we were very excited, anxious. We took time to pray about it, and it did not work out. Uh, they had already found a home for four boys by the time we called back to say, yes, we will take those children. So actually our second call was the first time that we actually got children into our home. So when we were finishing the process of getting licensed, in my mind, my timing was that we would become licensed right at the start of summer break because I'm a teacher and what better time to get the first phone call for a foster child than when you've got eight weeks off of work already. But this process has taught me time and time again, God's timing is not my timing. So we had some things that took longer than we expected, and we actually became licensed right at the end of summer break. And we actually got the phone call for our first placement when school was starting back in about four days, and the day after I had had a medical procedure. So that was not at all the timing that I would have chosen. Yeah, it was, I think it was like after dinner, I remember it being dark outside and we got the phone call and I was like super excited but also kind of nervous. Mostly I was just curious because I don't think they told us any details other than it was like, what, a five-year-old boy? 
No, he was three. He was... He's three? Gosh. It was forever ago then. But yeah, a three-year-old boy. And I remember just being really excited to get to meet this kid. Because I've always loved kids, too. And so to get to meet this kid and help him out. We went on a work trip to New Orleans. And actually moved our flight to an earlier flight to get home sooner. And 10 minutes after we walked into the door, we got the call. Yes, and there was just a bunch of, you know, of course, the emotion, the fear of like, hey, is this the right thing? Is this God's time? But it had to be God's time. Like we changed our flight and all of a sudden this stuff fell into place. If we had been on the other flight, we would not have gotten that call, it would have been in the air. So it's just so crazy how God worked in that moment and really, you know, was able to allow this to happen. Of course, the other emotions came, the, you know, again, the fear, the, um, the unknowing. Yeah, so the, the girls showed up at 1.30 asleep. We took them straight to the bedroom, laid them down, and then went over all the paperwork and logistics stuff with Faith Bridge. And I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was peeping into that doorway every hour to think, when, when are they going to wake up? What am I going to do when they wake up? And we decided that Alex would just go to work that day because we're just going like, we're going to need this time off eventually, but we, we both work full-time jobs. So he went to work and that morning, they, those girls slept until like noon and I was just still peeping through the door waiting on them to wake up. Um, the other interesting part was once they finally woke up is when we realized they didn't understand English completely. Um, so that was exciting and fun and scary all at the same time because it was just a level of unknown that I wasn't expecting. It was the most incredible. I mean, we went to pick her up and we got home and our entire porch was covered to the to the windows of things for her. And it was just, I don't even know who brought all of the things, but we couldn't have wanted or needed for anything for her for weeks. And we had care covered, like it was such a God nod of, I told you that I would do it. And it just, it, by far, the most clear message that we were doing the right thing. For me, that moment was um, if the anticipation, because obviously you have the anticipation of a 45 minute drive there to, to, to get her. Um, but and all the emotions of that uh, was tough. And then we get there and they only let Carrie go back to see her and hold her and get all the information from the nurses uh, about her. And so I'm there with Brayden and Addison, the twins, and we're just in the waiting room waiting. They're asking me all these questions. And so you're just sitting there with anticipation and starting to get some text messages with pictures and whatnot. But uh, it, there's a lot of emotions that go through. Like you basically find out you're, you're pregnant having the baby all on the same day. <laughs> and the call for Dax was a little bit different. Um, we had known that Dax was born. Um, we actually have very close contact with Charlotte's maternal grandmother, and she's the one that told us that Dax was born. Um, so for a month, he was in the NICU. We were not sure if he was gonna need us or not. So we were kind of in limbo for a month. Um, and then we were actually out of town. We were about three hours away at my family's um, for Christmas, and we got the call that, that he needed a home. Um, and we asked if they were going to be able to kind of hold him for the night and we'd be there the next day. They were not able to do that. So we had within 10 minutes, we had to pack up our, our whole family and drive two and a half hours. They were sitting in our um, driveway when we got there, but so was our small group. They had remembered our code to our garage. They'd opened our garage. There was a crib in our room. There was everything that we needed for Dax. Um, so then when we got there, he was there. And again, we just had the responsibility to love and care on him. Yeah, it was like a replay, <laughs> you know? We, we had that with Charlotte coming home, and then you come home with Dax, and it's the same thing. Everything's taken care of. You have almost everything you need. So um, that first placement, they bring him to the home, and just to finally have those questions answered, because they don't tell you much information about a child, to have a face to put with the name, um, and he was such a ball of energy. I didn't think he would ever stop moving around and exploring the new space. I remember seeing him for the first time and letting him explore the house and being really excited to show him the bunk beds in the room he was going to be staying in. 
and letting him pick whether he won the top bunk or the bottom bunk and it was just a really it was it was cool you know it was like having a play date but also getting to help someone out when we went to uh first meet our adoptive daughter now morgan and her two half brothers we had very mixed emotions and that's pretty common for foster care you're excited you're hesitant you're concerned about the outcome of the situation that you are willingly stepping into i say all that to say that once we met with the kids the rest was just we would do whatever was needed in order to be with them to help them and to love them My greatest reward from foster care is to watch our kids love on kids from hard places. Um, we were so protective of them at the beginning and they seem to understand it so much better than we do. Um, and it's been hard for us when we get ready to say goodbye and it's so easy for them to know, well, it was just, we were just supposed to love them for right now or we were just supposed to be there for now. So that's been my best takeaway is to watch my kids thrive. 2021 was really hard. Dax was sick a lot. We spent seven to 10 days in the hospital every month of 2021 with him. Um, and <clears throat> we took turns as much as we could. Um, I spent Father's Day in the ICU with Dax so that Josh could be at home with our other three kids. And then he would he spent Mother's Day. Um, and we were really, we both work. We really struggled to know if we could care for him in the capacity that he was going to need care for. With three children, we worked full time. We weren't 100% sure that we, was God preparing us to be able to give him to a family that could meet his needs? Um, so we were really wrestling with that. And Josh was with him in Atlanta on Mother's Day. I was in the hospital with Dax on Mother's Day. Uh, I saw my brother like had recently come out called Talking with Jesus. And um, if you've heard the song, there's a part in it where he talks about t his son walking in while he's praying. And so I always thought about my older son, Braden, through that song. And I was sitting in the hospital watching our Mother's Day service. We start playing that song. And I'm holding the X, and I have, like, for the first time I connect with him, seeing him walking in, seeing me pray, and that that had always been something that I thought about Braden, and that was like the moment that I really, I really felt like he, we were gonna adopt him, and, and I felt connected to him as my son, more so than I had before. So, I don't, like, I don't know if I can, <laughs> I, I can't really get through that very well, so. Oh, greatest reward is being able to help these sweet children that have done nothing to deserve their circumstances and to kind of fill in the gap. Um, there's so many parts of foster care that can be hard to understand, but love is not hard to understand. The greatest reward to this date, I think, is being able to accept our daughter, um, our adopted daughter Morgan into our family, but also knowing that we still get to have a relationship with her brothers, her half brothers, so. Um, definitely adopting our daughter and, you know, being, being called dad for the first time is amazing. I never, I didn't think, there was a while there where I didn't think that was gonna happen. Um, a surprising reward for me was being able to pour into the parents that you you're planning on helping the kids and your intention is to, to help the kids but being able to also when the kids are going and visiting with their parents and you don't know if they're going to go back uh being able to pour into the parents and seeing the parents succeeding afterwards after the kids go back is amazing so one thing i say about foster care often is that it's the hardest thing we've ever done and it's the best thing we've ever done. So one of my best memories was also a 
really, really hard memory. Um, the kids that were placed with us for the longest, we had in our home for a combined total of about two and a half years. And about a week into the first time they were placed with us, um, the little boy who at the time was eight, nine, yeah, I think somewhere around there, um, he, he looked to me and he said, how long do we get to stay here? And I was just totally thrown off guard. I, I looked at him and I said, well, you know, as long as you need to stay here, you know, your mom's working on things. And so we're praying that you get to go home to her, but you get to stay here as long as you need to stay here. And you could just see like him kind of melt and let go of some tension. And he said, are you sure? Because everywhere else, after about a week or two, they call and say they can't handle my sister. And I said, yeah, buddy, I'm sure. We, we really like having you in our home. We really like having your sister in our home too. And you know what? He didn't believe me. He made me tell him like 10 things I liked about his sister because he just could not believe that I liked having his sister in our home. And so I proceeded to tell him a bunch of things I liked about his sister and a bunch of things I liked about him. And um, I think that was such an eye-opening moment to me to better understand some of the fears he was holding on to and also what our role could be in his life. And I think it helped me to be super intentional to build relationship also with their mom. And I've seen so much fruit come out of that intentionality and the relationship. Um, you know, we've seen her come to have a relationship with the Lord. Um, and I, you know, just think being open to ministering not only to a child, but to their family has been really powerful for us. Yeah. My most impactful moment, I guess, was when um, my little sister, foster sister, the one that she was referring to earlier, she started counting because of the Mickey Mouse show and she is autistic and nonverbal and she started counting and she started progressing more instead of just, she was like a wild child when she first came to us. And I mean that in the most literal way possible. Like you couldn't pick her up without her head butting you because she didn't know how to interact with people and she had been through a lot of stuff. And just watching her grow as, as the amazing little girl she is and seeing her, you know, show love to us in her own special way. That's is the, and one of the greatest feelings in the world is just watching her grow and knowing that I got to be a part of that. I got to help her and be involved with her life. Um, as far as for me, the greatest reward by far has been the, the more that I had to rely on God during the season because, you know, God put all this in place and really allowed me to be in this moment to be able to have these kids. And, you know, and I've heard it said so many times, even by Pastor Carl, that God, God didn't call us to be comfortable and really just making sure that I have to step out of my um, the comfort zone in order to thrive, in order to get closer to God. So I've never been more closer to God that I am now, it is hard, it is tough. It, you know, if there's some days I'm thinking, hey, is this the right thing, is this for me? Um, but at the end of the day, I know that this is God's purpose and God's calling in my life, and it's because I stepped out and, had, and you know, and really took a step of faith and not just sat back on the sidelines and waited. And so that's really been my, you know, powerful testimony as far as that. For me, the biggest reward has been seeing the um, adjustment in our biological children. Um, they just have accepted these girls in our home. They've shared their room, they've shared their toys, they've shared their parents, their time. Um, and just knowing that when things kind of get crazy, my 10 year old son's the one who's like, all right, well, let's pray about it. Let's sit down and talk about Jesus. That, that's the biggest reward to see that maybe we've done something right with them that we can continue to help other kids. 
There's so many intricate details of God throughout our story that it's just, it's hard. It's hard not to tell all of them because they're so woven together. One leads directly to the other and it's helped us to be obedient faster <laughs> in the first time and to know that he's gonna take care of it. Um, and then, I mean, even with all of Dax's disabilities, we took them one step at a time knowing that God was gonna provide. And he has so far provided every single thing that he's needed for him to thrive. That's that's the most common reaction I get when you tell people, like, I could never do that. Because I'd, I'd be too attached. Yeah, because I'd be too attached. But when you meet a mom or a dad who's had a hard situation and they've made bad choices and then you're watching them fight, like right now with the two we have, like, they really are trying to fight to get their kids back. So it's hard not to want to help them. It's, it's weird because it really has transformed us in the fact that like when we were facing all the stuff with infertility, we were so focused on, oh, this is, we're des this feels a desperate. And then now it's like, oh really? This is what we were called to do. That, that was nothing but a stepping stone to get us to go in this direction is what it feels like. And it's weird to say that infertility for us is kind of like a blessing, but then we wouldn't have more again. Yeah, I mean, in our thought all the time is we should have we should have done this sooner. Like, yeah, we why did we wait? Why did we wait? We wasted time. As you can see, God is doing some incredible things in and through these families and in the lives of these children. What if we, as a church, all came together? around these families and other families who God may be putting this on your heart today to love all the orphans in our state? What if we could eradicate orphan care needs in our state? What if, if we had families waiting on children instead of children waiting on families? You say, I can't, I can't take a child into my home. I'm not in that season. You know what you can do? You can serve our foster care families by serving in kids ministry. You can serve our foster care homes by serving in youth ministry. What if every single mom and dad or single mom or dad in our church felt so supported by their church? What if men came alongside and loved on these children who, who don't have fathers, who their dads abandoned them? What about the young lady or the lady with an untimely pregnancy, but she's so glad that her church cares? What if we had people who wanted to find a home for their children and they knew the place to find a home that would raise those children to love God and love others would be relevant church. I believe that if our church would rise up, this could be one of the greatest seasons of life change in the next generation. In, our, in the future of our church, and I'm, excuse me, in the history of our church, but also I think in the history of our state. I remind you that we are a community of people helping people live out their purpose in Jesus Christ. And I believe this is what people, helping people, should look like.